And with that, let's open the floor to, to you all for questions, uh, for comments. We're here until five. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to say thank you very much to Lonnie Bunch and to Kevin Gover for putting this great symposium together. I think it's really been very interesting and a wonderful way to take on a topic, the topics that need taking on, and so thank you very much. Um, I also, in the discussion this afternoon, was thinking so much about uh, what you all were saying, and I so believe that of course we've got to keep some of these things around, just like the Holocaust Museum that has all of that horror that went on uh, so that people will remember, because sometimes if people don't remember, uh, it allows them to forget and then more horrors can continue in the future. So I think what you've done here, Lonnie, and I think Kevin is doing at the Museum of the American Indian, I think are, are very important things. But my question is, that, that, I, that I wanted to ask, I can understand the experimental thing, Stephanie, that you mentioned about publicizing that in order to talk about keeping the horrors alive. But the, the Dred Scott discussion, with the three fifths of a human. Are we, do we want our young people, who oftentimes don't feel young minority, African American people, who often don't feel so good about themselves just due to their life's beginning experiences, to have to deal with that as well? It, does that concern anybody uh, about that one, not the experimental and making it a, a big, uh, something to remember, but the other. You're, you're talking about one in particular, but I think every, every monument that we've spoken about has a potential to be damaging. And I think that's why it requires this thoughtful conversation, because um, we know that there is, uh, even when you're right, it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences, right? That, there, that, um, that you, you have to be right and careful at the same time, because if you're right means that you're potentially making young people um, feel less than, then how do you address that? Uh, but you don't, ha you don't get to those answers without going through it. Oh, no, having... I think many of those should go down. I was speaking to Lonnie's oh, discussion sorry. of keeping some so we, they won't be forgotten about what the history was. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm Jim Lowen. I was actually the expert witness, along with one other person, uh, engaged by the Baltimore Commission, commission, commissioned, and uh, so you know me. Uh, and you were, have been very neutral here, uh, Mr. Chairman, but you, I don't, we didn't find you neutral in Baltimore. Uh, we thought you were pretty clearly on behalf of uh, keeping all the monuments where they were. Uh, and, of course, by a vote of four to three, two of them, your commission did suggest to be moved. Uh, by six to one, two of them you suggested to stay. But the elephant in the room is the Charlottesville event. Uh, within four days of the activity in Charlottesville, uh, Baltimore's new mayor recognized that and this happened all around the country, that these monuments are flashpoints for conflict, and they were all foregone. And I, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts since then, since they're all gone, and I know you were on the side of keeping them all, um, do you think that that's a mistake, or possibly is there something to be said for not having these flashpoints of conflict in prominent city places where they express the power of the white supremacists that put them up? So the, the, the challenge I think with, um, with taking them down is there, it's, Baltimore's still a flashpoint. Um, and um, there will continue to be in our uh, society these, fla these racial flashpoints. So uh, taking them down I think is a, is a great uh, knee-jerk response, but it didn't create healing in our community. It didn't create conversation about Baltimore's racist history. Um, and nor did it create um, a, a pathway forward to, to talk about um, how we can be better as a community. Yeah. 
I have, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, and I, just to add to that, um, pretty much that was my take on it as well. But I also live in, you know, not too far from Sandtown. Uh, I was in, you know, the, the neighborhood where Freddie Gray, the Freddie Gray incident happened and many of the protests happened. And so, you know, we're willing to take down certain monuments in certain neighborhoods like Charles Village, but we're not addressing the monuments to poverty and racism that are in, on North Avenue in Sandtown. And so, you know, that goes back to your point, uh, Mayor, that it doesn't erase that conversation or those issues for people who live in North Avenue. I have two very quick questions. The first is for those uh, kind of affiliated with museums. This has been great today. I am very conscious that it's been a pretty cooperative conversation. Um, so I'm wondering if there's been any discussion with other museums um, and memorials about having these conversations at Mount Vernon and Monticello and places that attract people who perhaps wouldn't come to DC to go to the African Amer American Museum. And my second question is for those of you who um, served on commissions, um, and anyone who was on the panels this morning, three times people mentioned the psychological impact of these memorials on um, different youth. Um, I'm wondering, were there social psychologists or environmental psychologists looking at what it means to have these people on a pedestal um, in the commissions, and is that research available? And also, are the commission reports available online? Thank you. Oh, you want, you, I got, got the commission, you guys. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> So these issues were discussed, but I don't know of a scientifically created um, you know, study. So, so first of all, our commission report is available online. If you just, if you Google Monuments Commission, New York City, something, it'll come up, it's, it's available. It's about a 25 page document. But uh, if, I'd be very interested to hear if anybody does know about scientifically created social psychology experiments it's a little bit of a leading conversation because I'm actually talking to someone about designing that study. Okay, so okay. I, um, know that's I just want to make sure it's not yeah. replicating. There's much, much conversation, anecdotal evidence. People say they feel it. Do I know of a scientific survey? I don't. Well, you know, one of the things that sort of informed my approach to um, our commission was uh, Charles Taylor's thesis, The Politics of Recognition, and I think it actually might be a part of what introduces um, the conversations today. Uh, the whole idea of misrecognition and recognition. Uh, Taylor came up with this thesis at sort of the beginning. He, it, it's seminal work in what's considered diversity and multicultural studies, where you have this whole idea of the impact of being misrecognized, how history is misrecognized and not being recognized. And so that's some of the work, but also looking at the impact of negative images on, on people, particularly certain groups, whether it's women or uh, you know, Latinos or black males. I mean, there are different studies out there. Okay. To answer the question about museums and other sites, there's a lot of work already being done um, where we work with Monticello, there are other folks working in you know, a variety of places. I think the power of this kind of conversation is that the Smithsonian gives other places cover. It's an umbrella that allows them to wrestle with many of these. And so our sense is that through the writings we do, through these kinds of programs, through what we do at national conferences, that it begins to make sure that the conversations that are already going um, are amplified. And those that need to have the conversation feel they have the cover to do that. So that's our hope. I too thank you for a marvelous day. And the question that comes to mind is you look at the title, Memory Versus History. I didn't hear you give value to either one of those. Um, and then secondly, as I see how a new president dismantles affordable care health-wise, what happens after the monuments are gone? Okay, I'm not sure exactly the first part of your question, but almost the whole day was looking at the tension between history, which some can be defined as academic history, and public memory. And wrestling with that tension is recognizing that sometimes memory trumps history. Um, mm -hmm. And the goal here is to make sure that we bring the light of 
what we call truth, the light of good interpretation, to various historical questions such as these monuments, and our sense is that we're all made better when we illuminate those dark corners that are sometimes simply darkened by memory, and we want to illuminate by history. Okay, and, and I thank you for sharing that because I think that, at least for me, I was not sure that that was what was being done. So the articulation is good. The second part, though, after you take the monuments away, what keeps it from being like the Affordable Care Act and a new regime comes in to replace it with something even worse? Yeah, I yeah. So I mean, I think it, that one of the questions that we are asking ourselves in New York is, okay, so whatever we believe, we have a very progressive administration, we have values that we all share, if you start to alter history and start to take stuff down, who, what happens if, um, you know, three mayors ago, we had Giuliani, we had a, a, a conservative, then we had a moderate, um, Bloomberg, and now we have a liberal, but we might go back to a conservative, moderate, whatever. Um, what happens to history? That's why you have to be very, very careful about these kinds of um, situations in public. But also recognizing <clears throat> that our role is to say, you know, what's up in New York City is not an acceptable representation of the history of our city. So many people have been left out. Uh, it is not equitable. So we have to make our mark and our legacy has to be a, a legacy of equity because that's our values. Uh, I guess I had a few more uh, comments more so than questions. Uh, Six Nations member of the Mohawk uh, tribe uh, up in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. First off, this has been fantastic. <laughs> you guys did a really great job putting together uh, the panels. There was a bunch of very insightful information, um, so I commend you. She actually took my question about the social psychologist piece. <laughs> Uh, I would highly recommend that you look into uh, bringing social psychologists in. They've done uh, tens of thousands of research studies uh, looking at various, uh, I guess, racial topics. Uh, towards that end, what is a Native American Indian? In New York City, Mohawks actually constructed most of the city. They're primarily part of the Six Nations Reservation. Uh, I'm not sure what the intent of the uh, actual memorial would be, but it might actually be good to start opening a conversation toward that end with some of the affected parties. Absolutely, and I do want to say that we did have a tribally enrolled Mohawk representation on the, our commission, and that's one of the first people we're going to go talk to. So one of the tough things with uh, tribal things is you may have one individual but the way we work is in a tribe. We all make a decision kind of together. There is no one head decision maker. It's just a little bit different about how that structure typically works. So I, this actually follows well um, for her, on her comment. Um, first of all, I love this museum, but it's overwhelming. There's so much here. I want to point out two different things here. Um, there's a, uh, downstairs, there's an exhibit from the um, African Burial Ground in New York City. I was involved with that at GSA in the Office of Civil Rights 25 years ago. What happened was, we knew that was there. I mean, it was on the maps. But when they started building the federal building, which they needed to do, they excavated without any regard, respect for the um, remains that were there. And we had town hall meetings. And as a result of that, GSA paid a lot of money to excavate those remains, bring them down to Howard University where they were studied. They were eventually reinterred and a visitor center was put in there. But that was with community involvement, actually protest activists in front of the bulldozers. So we can learn from that. And actually this museum has a little bit of a, has mentioned and maybe that can be developed. I'll look and see if I have more papers regarding that. And the, but the other thing was, um, there was mentioned about um, Mitch Landro and uh, New Orleans, and they took down the, the four statues. But those, at least for Lee, he, as far as I know, he never set foot in that city. That's, and that statue was put up very recently, well, relatively recently, um, as a protest to seg a desegregation. It had nothing to do with 
the Civil War. It had to do with protesting desegregation. And it, it had no place. Um, we recommend that someone else who's been here to the museum um, as a speaker and also is, has, is upstairs on um, this video is rename it Leah Circle, Leah Chase Circle, in honor of a woman who has really brought a lot of pride to um, New Orleans. But, you know, so there are things that I, I, I appreciate um, Mr. Bunch's um, reference to pruning to make room for new things. And I think that would be quite appropriate. Thank I'd, you. I'd love to go to Leah Chase Circle. That sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> My name is Evie Terano, I'm a professor of art history and I have published extensively on the Confederate landscape. I was the first actually to study the Lee and Jackson Memorial in uh, Baltimore and I appreciate the highly nuanced approach. But I also want to alert us all that these monuments are not monolithic. Their stories are not monolithic. Certainly we know that the United Daughters of the Confederacy energized many of the generic ones, but the more particular ones were the result of very complex national commissions. Northern artists participated in their creation. In this particular case, Laura Frazier was a very important artist. Um, John Russell Pope, who created that pedestal, also created the Jefferson Memorial. So we have to be much more attentive to uh, the nuances. My concern is that the monuments have been removed, and I appreciate very much, actually, Mayor Rawlins' uh, reserved response as opposed to the current response, and they are now in a city-owned lot. As an art historian, this is my archive. This is what I have to depend on to reconstruct the complex, complicated, problematic histories of these monuments. And unfortunately, once they are removed from the public space, I do not have access to them. Art historians, and we are historians, we do not have access to them. So these are very important issues to consider. I am delighted that Harriet Senny who has published a lot on teachable monuments, is now energizing the work behind the commission. And I would also like to recommend, if there are artists, art historians, activists in the audience that are interested in publishing on this issue, whatever your approach, Public Art Dialogue is an academic body that publishes a very important journal that uh, deals with these issues, but I would like your perspective on what happens when this physical record is out of public access. Thank you. So, uh, by the way, thank you very much. Harriet Senny was one of the commission members. She did come up with the teachable monuments. I almost, you know, we have this problem as leaders that we take other people's ideas and we kind of forget that it's somebody else's idea. <laughs> so thank you for that, and I hope Harriet understands I'm giving her credit today. Um, but I do think, by the way, one of the things that the commission said is if we're taking stuff down, it should go to a public space. A museum would be a, a good place, another kind of public space. The one monument we're relocating now is being relocated to a place where people can go see it uh, in New York City. So we have, we have one last very quick comment. Question has to be very quick. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Sabrina Sampson, and I'm here on behalf of Impossible Design. We're a research design firm based in Baltimore. Um, first, I just really want to say thank you for facilitating this discussion. I think it was very necessary, and we learned some gr uh, wonderful things here today. Um, this question I'm opening to everyone on stage, but um, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the former mayor and um, Mr. Bryant, if you have any insight, please, please, please. Uh, the question is, we're looking for spaces. Um, the, the current mayor, she put out a proposal as to what we can replace the monument that was taken down, what we can replace that with. And we submitted something we thought was very great. And as you guys talked, we heard themes about reconciliation. And um, that's something we were trying to achieve. We went through a whole research portion and we came up with this design for an interactive piece because the art is really supposed to educate. You're supposed to learn. And we have to be very careful that you don't freeze time um, and misconstrue a story. So um, as we're looking for places to put this piece, I just want to ask if you guys have any advice as to you know, what spaces do you think are best? Can I ask you all to connect with her? 
uh, and talk to her about some possibilities uh, yeah, after, our, after our session. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, we're at five o'clock. We ran out of time. Uh, I do want you to be able to connect. Please come to the, to the front. In the meantime, let me thank you all. Let me ask you all to thank our panel one last time. Let me also thank uh, and ask Kevin Govers to come up to the stage uh, and to close out the symposium with Lonnie Bunch. Oh, there he is. Ah, there he is. <laughs> <laughs>